Welcome to our overview report of the DuPont College Schools Oral History Project. Now we we'll hear from Mike McGrath. Hi, I'm Mike McGrath, President of Preservation Delaware. Join me for the next few minutes to hear history. Yes, we're actually going to be listening to voices from the past. Delaware is a state steeped in history, but whose history is that? What places define our history? What voices from the past comprise our history? Too often in years gone by, whole swaths of our community have been left out of our shared stories. Preservation Delaware is committed to giving a voice to those underrepresented in Delaware's history. We have found a partner in this effort in the state of Delaware with Tim Slavin, our Delaware State Historic Preservation Officer. He assisted in securing funds for this project, which you're going to be hearing about from the National Park Service. This project of oral histories associated with the DuPont College Schools is literally an effort to give voice to these often overlooked stories in our history. So come with us and hear history. Today, you will be given a summarized view of the six schools built by Mr. DuPont and selected for this project. Our contributors to this project were Mike McGrath, Dr. Skelcher, Jim Wolf, Michael Emmons, Tim Pankos, and Dan Parsons, who is our moderator for this session. As I shared a moment ago, the project was carried out with assistance from the Historic Preservation Fund the National Park Service, and the Delaware Division of Historical and Cultural Affairs. The opinions, findings, conclusions, and recommendations expressed in this material are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the views or policies of these agencies. What were the purpose and goals of the project? Of course, it was to collect the oral histories that we're sharing today from former students, teachers, and members of the DuPont colored school community, but also we collected photographic and written materials, journals, diaries, schoolwork related to these respective schools and the lives of the people who attended. And finally, we aim to complement and link with the survey work completed by the University of Delaware's Center for Historic Architecture and Design that doc documented the existing school buildings and those places where schools once stood. Here is a map to show you the locations of the schools that were covered in our project. And these are the names of the schools we will be presenting in this report. The first of those schools is Hocassin College School number 107C, which was a one room, one and a half story brick building with an entrance hallway, a coat room, and a room for the stove that heated the building. Some of the topics of these former students included the awkwardness of the school's prominent role in the legal battle for school integration, their long-term and admired teacher, Mrs. Bujan, and hand-me-down old and used books with torn pages. Listen as Sonny Knott recalls the anguish faced by Mrs. Bueller to get bus service for her daughter, Shirley. Yeah, sure. I, yeah. I remember it um, so well. I remember Mrs. Buell, Shirley's mother, they lived on Limestone Road, and they had an egg business. They used to sell eggs and stuff. Hmm. And uh, she she caught the devil. I just plain, I, that lady caught the devil from both sides. I remember, uh, don't forget now, this is, this, is, this is back in the early 50s. This is back. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, a lot of people of color had a lot of fear embedded in them. Okay? So mm -hmm. they had this stigma of we're all getting along. Why are you starting, up, starting trouble? Because they were comfortable with the way we were living. Mm -hmm. And the, and I even had my parents tell me, you can't do what they do because you're not white. 
So they accept it. But Mrs. Bueller, all she wanted was for that bus to stop, pick her child up, and went it went right past. They wouldn't do it because they had no 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 bus for the colored kids. They wouldn't let the child get on the bus. So she was determined, and I give her a lot of credit. She, her her egg business dropped off. The white folks stopped buying egg from her. Some of the black folks did too. Wasn't my one church to go to. The, the people in church talked against her. Was my understanding. You know, why are you starting up this trouble? You know, you know, it's some of the stigma that went on. So she, I give her a lot of credit. She. Now we will turn our attention to Harwood High, the oldest high school for African Americans in Delaware, which was built in 1927 by P.S. DuPont, and it was touted as a new magnificent school for colored people. The school is named for General Oliver Otis Howard, who headed the Freemen's Bureau after the Civil War. Howard High also played a key role in the Gebhardt versus Dalton case, one of the five cases of the Brown versus Board of Education. The case in Delaware involved Claymount parents suing to have their children attend a nearby Claymount High School, rather than being bused 10 miles to Howard High. Former students from Howard were very vocal on several topics that included their admiration for their teachers who were caring, professional, and well-dressed, hand-me-down old used books with torn pages, their dominant baseball, basketball, and football teams, the admiration for their state-of-the-art, beautiful, spacious, and well-equipped buildings, and the orderly and well-behaved student population. Listen as Sonny Knott from Hocassin describes his awe of the school and Maurice Pritchard recalls his admiration for the school. We had to take a bus to get there. Yeah, but the bus was, that, that was just a ride. But the, the most exciting thing to me at Howard School was this mass building with all these rooms. Don't mm. forget, I came out of one room in sixth grade. Right. Now I'm to a, a school with multiple rooms and every room had, had its own grade. And that was that just like blew me out of the water. I had never seen that long hallways and all. I'd never seen nothing like this. And, <laughs> and I was... It was uh, a great experience for me, number one. Uh, number two, I think we went in probably around eight something. We would uh, go into the building and uh, everybody uh, entered uh, on the uh, side of the building. That's where we went in. And it was just uh, uh, an opportunity where you went in, you were, you were greeted by the administrative team. Uh, you had teachers who were right there. It was so nice and kind and very serious, well-dressed, and they exemplified professionalism on a daily basis. And that's what I remember uh, so much about the school. Even the, uh, the men, uh, they wore ties. Uh, and they were uh, neatly dressed. And that, that was very inspirational to me. And uh, now let's listen as Dolores Blakey adds more praise and admiration for the teachers and the school. Those teachers made quite an impression. And then there was one that I loved, my chemistry teacher, Dr. Taylor. Uh, chemistry, I, the subject, it was okay, but I really enjoyed him uh, the most. Uh, and of course, my other, my elective, elective, the theater, I've been doing theater all my life. So I love theater and, and chorus. But those were some of my outstanding um, teachers that I remember it was Gwendolyn. And um, like I said before, Ms. Allie Holly, Dr. Taylor, uh, Mr. Anderson, it was a whole flock of teachers that they were just excellent people. 
um, very well qualified uh, beyond and really was interested in you learning. And, um, you know, when you're young, you don't really think about the, how capable and things they were until you get older. Then when you get out of school and you see how well prepared you are. Here we have Major Harrison discussing his admiration for the school and lamenting the hand-me-down books they use and his good friend, Ned Brown, who was known as Haas during his school days due to his prowess in sports. Uh, definitely, uh, I, I think it uh, should be remembered because at that particular time, Howard was the only school for blacks at that particular time, so all of us went there. So uh, it was like, you know, like, uh, it's very special to all of us because that's, you know, like I said, at that particular time until my senior year, that was the only high school or junior high school that we could attend. So consequently, um, uh, to this day, I have special memories of Howard and I could go on and on. In fact, I don't know if you want to know, but in fact, uh, last year I was uh, inducted into the Wall of Fame at Howard. So I have a lot of fond memories of, about Howard and uh, all my friends that, I, you know, uh, that I made at Howard, and some are still my friends to this day. So Howard has a special place uh, in my heart and, and in my memory. Remember about I remember, I remember, uh, football, basketball, and football, basketball, and track. Okay. And we were, we were very successful uh, basketball-wise. Our senior year, we won what we call a big five. Uh, our football team was good, a little better than average, but I, I enjoyed it and the track teams were outstanding. In fact, the track team helped running track. I got a, a scholarship to Morgan State for track. So I remember track very well. I think we got hand-you-down books, if I'm not mistaken. We may have gotten a few new, but for the most part, if I recall, we got hand-you-down books from the white schools, I believe. Now, I'm not 100% on that, but I don't think we got a whole lot of new books uh, when I was in junior high school and at Howard. Now we turn our attention to Rabbit's Ferry School, number 201C. This was a one-room schoolhouse built in 1919 by P.S. DuPont to educate Native American and African American students in the Robbinsville area of Sussex County. It had wooden siding, a brick chimney, a covered entrance supported by columns. On a side wall, there was a large bank of six windows next to a smaller window. The original school building is visible to the right of the new building. Main topics that those students shared included the family atmosphere in the classroom, pluses and minuses of living in a rural farming community, the family culture of their majority Native American close-knit community in and outside of the school building, their memories and attention to school day details. And now we'll hear both from Dr. Fern Bliss Morgan, who will talk about the secondhand books and close-knit community, and Paul Selby, who contrasts the education at white schools versus the black schools. Every day we're discarding, that's what we got. Mm. So, you know, our social studies was whatever was in the social studies book. Right. So what can you tell me a little bit more about your teacher, Mrs. Norwood? What can I tell you, Mrs. Norwood was, first of all, she lived in the community. Mm. We all lived in the same community and every one of us, everyone that lived in the community was family. Okay. Because my aunt lived down the road, that's the cousins I would get a ride with and she had about seven or eight children. So that was a good little lump. Then the next house was our house and it was my sister and I. Then we would go down the road to our aunts and uncles that lived there and that was we would pick up maybe two children there if they were staying with their grandmother, go on the other road. And then we would be, we would catch up with about 
two or three other students. And then we would go to the corner and go down the other road to the school and we'd pick up a maybe. So when we were going, it would be a group of us all going together. Well, Miss Norwood, where we lived, she lived through the woods and down on the other end of the road. So we were all a community. So Miss Norwood was like to us um, students by being a member of the community. And we grew up knowing the entire family and our families knew her mother and father and family. So it was just like we were a big family. Mm. But she took no nonsense. Now, outside of there, plus I also, when we went to church, went to church with Miss Norwood. Some of us, we would go to church and we all went to the same church. And if she wasn't singing in the choir, I sat with Miss Norwood in church. Mm. So, so it was like she was our big, our big sister and our mother. But when we were with the segregated schools, how do you, how did you view the difference between white education and black education? I well, did not have any comparison nor thought about it whatsoever. Um, I didn't. Um, it, the life that I lived and experienced was simply that, and it was not any comparative or anything otherwise that I have any recollection of. Um, one good note I will tell you is that Friday afternoon became community time because that was when all the kids in the neighborhood, regardless of race, creed, nor color, came together to enjoy the weekend. Uh, we all played together, we shared time on the weekends and come, you know, Sunday evening or whatever, we went back home and I said went back home. We started the week knowing that we were the Richard Allen school was the southernmost of the school and was built on the same site of the original school in 1927. The school was named for the freed slave Bishop Richard Allen, who founded the African Methodist Episcopal Church in 1794. For years, the Richard Allen School was a hub of learning and community in the early and mid 1900s. These students were concerned with a real sense of racial tension and strife, a gratefulness for caring and supportive teachers who taught respect, hand me down old used books with torn pages. Listen as Solomon. Henry talks candidly about his teachers and secondhand books, and Peggy Trot shares her memories of the teacher's interest in students. Oh, it was a very pleasant day here. We had very good teachers, were very interested in the students. And uh, I guess in the first grade, you know, like it was, always like to bring an apple to the teacher because she looked so pretty to you. And my first grade teacher, I think she had just graduated from Delaware State, Delaware State College at that particular time. Her name was Ruth K. Moore. Most of the attention we got was to math, English, and social studies. We got books that were secondhand books, hand-me-down books, which came from the Georgetown Special School District, which only had a few pages. Some of them were gone and all that. And most of the education we seem to have got was what our teachers were well versed. And they knew that you had the potential to do that. So they would come to you and they would take time with you. You either sacrifice your um, recesses. If you didn't know something, sacrifice your recesses and they would help you with the subject, which a lot of people, uh, math, they had a hard time with math. So if you wanted to sacrifice your research, the teacher would stay in with you while everybody else went out and played, and they would show you how to do it. But they didn't believe in letting anybody just slowly fail. They try not to fail you. When you fail, that's because you didn't really do your homework. You didn't really reach out to the teacher. But they didn't really get a pleasure in failing you. 
They always worked with you, and they were concerned, and they were like your parents away from home because they would discipline you. If you were out of order, behave badly, they would believe and discipline you, and they would send a note to your parents, and your parents would discipline you again. So you couldn't come to school and act up because they were for serious reasons. So now let's turn our attention to State College for Colored Students High School, or the Delaware State College High School. It was a two-room brick school building near or associated with the State College for Colored Students. The building has a center front arched entrance supported by columns. Each classroom had a large bank of six windows on the rear wall. Now, these former students talked about the challenges and pleasures of living away from home and on your own, the rigors of campus life and independent studies, admiration for their teacher's manner of dress, the professionalism and status as real role models in the community. Now let's hear from Susan Young Brown, a woman who is young at 103 years old discuss the pleasures and benefits of living on campus and students' campus responsibilities. At that time, most of us in high school had come from the country, yeah. and we did not have electricity, and we did not have running water, and we did not have heated homes. So mm. school was a really a... a lovely place for us to be. Well, you had, uh, you had, well, you, of course, your first thing, you had to make sure your room was clean. You were responsible for keeping the room clean. And uh, on the weekend, of course, you had to uh, scrub the wash up your floor and change your bed and just have to make sure that you had a clean room, and uh, and then also uh, uh, different ones worked in the in the dining hall. Some of them were working as waitresses, and then some worked in the kitchen. And uh, those were some of the duties that you had to do. That at first. They didn't pay you, but later on, I think they would give you uh, a little bit of cash for working in the kitchen and being a waitress. And now let's listen to Bill Evans as he recalls his first impressions of entering the campus in 1945. Then it would take us to the entrance of Delaware State College. And we got off the bus and we walked up a lane. Okay. And could always remember the, the sign that was actually there uh, that pretty much guide us for the day. I don't know why they, it was there. It was there because it says, uh, all who enter, enter to learn and go forth to serve. Dr. Reba Ross Hollingsworth, 95 years young, who attended four DuPont schools and graduated from Delaware State College High School in 1945. As we turn our attention to our last school, Thomas D. Clayton, one of the most modern and most spacious of colored elementary schools in the state, which you can see from the picture, T.D. Clayton, as it was affectionately known, was a one-story brick school building featured covered arch side entrances and five classrooms. Each classroom had a large bank of six windows. The location was in an expanding community area for African-Americans in Smyrna, Delaware. Construction started on January 21st, 1921, and was completed on October 1st, 1921. 
former students from this school had many positive things to say about the school. They talked about the admiration for their great teachers, the closeness of their community in and outside of school, their love for their school and school activities, their juxtaposition between segregated colored schools and newly integrating white schools. We will begin with Bill Evans, who will share his memory of the, the typical school day during the 1930s at T.D. Clayton School. And then we will hear from Alice Coleman as she recalls her great teachers and principals. Uh, each morning, we, we had to stand and each person had to recite a verse from the Bible. Each person? Each person in the classroom. Oh, how yep. about, okay. And then from there, uh, we said the Pledge of Allegiance. And shortly after that, uh, we started into, uh, she would actually then give us directions for the day. And on the blackboard, which was all the way around, you had each one of the subject areas that we would be involved in that day. Mm -hmm. And we had to write in the composition book. And that was more or less our guide to guide us through the, the day. And that was done every day. Every day, okay. For each, for each subject, yeah. Each subject, and she would tell us the reason why it was important to make sure we paid attention and learned the information and how it was going to help us in the future. Years there. Well, you know, um, be, the teachers at that point always dressed really nice. Mm -hmm. um, and they carried themselves and um, I call it professional. They looked good. They spoke well. Um, and they were good role models. Okay. Um, earlier, I had wanted to be a teacher, and I think it was because actually they were the only professional people that I knew about at the time. Like I said, my parents were were migrants, and um, my my mother was a very religious person, so her only interest was that you know I'd be a good girl. And um, that was more in terms of my moral standards and this kind of thing. Right. Um, and she wanted me to go to school and do well, but it, it wasn't that she gave me any particular direction in terms of Lastly, we will hear from Sandy White as she shares several of her memories. I think we started about uh, also between 8.30 and 9 o'clock. And a typical day I'm sort of describing would be the class, the second and third grade room. And normally after the bell rang, um, we would either read or recite the 23rd Psalm or Psalm 100. And then saluted the flag, and then started our daily lessons, which were reading, penmanship, arithmetic, grammar, spelling. Uh, we broke for lunch maybe after two classes, and had recess after lunch, and... I really can't remember a lot of social studies. I guess um, the teachers and I think the um, manner in which Mr. Blackburn, the principal, nearly made all the students feel special, I think well, I just heard someone say that he actually knew most of the students 
by name. Okay. And whenever he saw us in the hallway, or if he would enter the classroom, you know, just just the way he um, carried himself, you know, just made you proud to be in that school. This is simply what I felt about it. My education differed in the black or colored schools because we were loved and cared for. Uh, we participated in many activities, especially plays. Uh, in the white schools, you are usually set aside and very rarely given any leading roles in classroom activities or extracurricular activities. And very little grammar was corrected or taught at the white school. More, there was more participation with parents at the college school because when parents uh, were called, then they were actually, I mean, once there was integration, they felt inferior and intimidated when they were called in to discuss their child or children. Pauline, I am very pleased to share some of the ephemera and memorabilia donated to this project by various participants of the project. Starting at the top left, we have members of Howard's senior class of 1955. Next to that is an album of T.D. Clayton School assembled by Sandra Twiggett White, Sandy White, that you just heard from. Howard's championship based basketball team of 1955, members of the school reunions, members of the Clayton, uh, Clayton School student body from classes 1939 to 1941, photos of one of their enviable school reunions, and lastly, a photo journal constructed of cardboard in 1944 by Dr. Reba Ross Hollingworth that displayed all of the Negro colleges she visited during her senior year at the State College High School that later became known as Delaware State College High School. And now let's wind down our presentation today. Talking about uh, some of the lessons we learned. Now, of course, there'll be a full report that'll come out about the oral history projects of the DuPont Colored Schools. But we did learn a few things that we think in the future we can use as we expand this project under the aegis of Preservation Delaware or for others that do such work. Skilled and reliable group of professionals, of course, is essential. We establish chronological and timeline basis for participant questions. We need to establish and maintain efficient cloud and external hard drive storage. We established and need to establish even more so efficient and easy to use delivery system for all communications to participants. We need to establish a more uniform system of summarizing all the interviews. We need to require a uniform format for information forms. And we'd like to place more emphasis in the future on the collection of ephemera and memorabilia. Again, in conclusion, look out for the full report to come out soon. We thank you for participating in today's webinar. We hope that you've been able to appreciate hearing a voices from the past and actually sitting in to hear history. Thanks to Dr. Abdullah Muhammad for his leadership on this project. And I remain your president of Preservation Delaware, Mike McGrath. Thank you for that presentation. Um, I can just add that, you know, having participated in a project that uh, no presentation could give, do 
justice to all the wonderful people that we uh, interviewed and uh, talked to. We really got some amazing stories. Now, there are a few questions. Um, uh, let's see. Can uh, you tell me how many schools uh, that we that we documented are still standing? Abdullah? Yeah, I can uh, begin by saying that, uh, well, good morning to everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Dan, am I coming through okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, just want to let you know that um, there were 20 schools that we originally looked at as far as uh, being qualified to be a part of this project. There were 80 schools that were uh, DuPont College schools that were built by Mr. DuPont. And um, I'm not exactly certain as to how many are still standing. But I do know the 20 that we looked at, they were definitely standing. So that was why they were uh, considered eligible for this project. Um, the, uh, the parallel program that I believe Mike spoke about when um, we in the presentation that is with Chad, um, it focused more on all of the uh, DuPont schools. So uh, when we uh, uh, team up with um, Chad and get that report together, uh, so that we can match up those locations, we'd be able to give, give a more exact number as to how many schools are still standing. Mike, do, do you have any information on that line um, from uh, Mike Emmons as far as how many are still standing? I know that uh, we identify at least 20 that are still standing. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think we have that number yet. Um, so, some of it has to do with, of course, whether they're actually in their original form or whether they've been, uh, you know, renovated and changed to serve, serve some other function. I do uh, know Michael Emmons shared that they've been able to document 92, I think is the number he mentioned to me at one point total. Uh, that includes some that have disappeared from the scene. Well, one other thing I want to add, Dan, about, you know, looking at the big picture is to remind our our viewers today, those in the webinar, that of course, uh, Dr. Abdullah Muhammad and his, uh, his team, uh, your team, collected uh, literally hundreds of hours of interviews. Today was just, of course, a small sort of uh, sample of, of, of those that we found most informative and interesting uh, as snippets. And also that all of this uh, the oral interviews are, have been converted into transcripts, actually hard copies, and then summarized as well. So this has been a big project that's going to provide a lot of material for, for future resources, re researchers and as a resource to those in the general public who may want to dig deeper. We had a question from Barbara Warnell. She wanted to know how many Black elementary and high schools were in each of the three counties, and uh, do we ever get a uh, handle on how many have provided housing. Now, I'm not sure the last part of the question you said, how many are handling housing? No, how many provided housing? How many also, like Dell State provided housing? Did any other schools provide housing? No, I believe uh, Dell State was the only one. Um, before, um, a, a number of um, Delawareans uh, that were eligible to go to high school uh, was able to go to... Um, the high school in um, at Dell State down in uh, Dover, they would travel to Wilmington and they would live with a friend of the family or a relative, because that was the only way that they could come to go to Howard. There was there was no um, campus life available at Howard. Uh, the only campus life was at uh, Dell State. And what I have to point out so that folks are not confused. The uh, original name for uh, the, the high school in Dover was called the State College for Colored Students High School. Then it was changed to the State College High School. And then it was changed to Delaware State College High School. And the reason for the change was uh, they lost their accreditation and had to reform under another name. And that's how the name Delaware State College High School came about. 
I just uh, I remember having participated. I uh, this is the first time I've ever tried to do an oral history project over a pandemic, and it was a difficult thing to organize. I appreciate you uh, handling that, and uh, we did the best we could to pull it off. I think there was a lot of difficulty in trying to meet the you know we were dealing with it. An, uh, an elderly population and trying to coordinate all that was just very difficult. And I just want to, you know, I, I, I will say that doing this project really helped me get through the pandemic myself. And I want to thank you for letting me participate. So we, uh, we have a question. What do we know about the teachers, where they were educated? Were they Delawareans or did they come from other parts of the country? Well, a, a number of them um, came from Howard because Howard was the premier high school and um, they went to Howard, but as far as um, their post-grad education, they were mostly educated at the um, um, uh, colleges that were uh, basically your, your uh, UNBC colleges, the, uh, the HBC colleges that were located in other states. And then they came back to Delaware because uh, for mostly, they were just looking for teaching, teaching position. You have to remember there were not a lot of teaching positions available for African-American who were educated. That's why at Howard and at the uh, State College High School, you had a number of uh, master degree teachers and doctorate degree teachers teaching there because they just couldn't get jobs at the colleges or the other uh, uh, institutions. Yeah, um, I would also add, uh, uh, Ms. Norwood mentioned in her commentary that um, she had a teacher from Delaware State College. So there was probably some of that in the elementary school level. Uh, and I do want to go back to a previous question, Dan, and, and recognize that Michael Emmons signed on and said around 47 of the uh, schools are still standing. I believe that was his current estimate. Oh, thank Mike for that. Um, let's see. Was there a relationship between the DuPont schools in Delaware and the Rosenwald schools uh, established in the South? Um, that was something that I had hoped was a reality, but it's not as far as um, all of the uh, material I've seen thus far. I believe there must have been some consideration of the work that was being done to build the Rosenwald School when Mr. DuPont actually looked at it, but th there is no documented um, reference to that, that I could say, you know, here's the link between why he started these schools here. Uh, if anyone online knows about it that uh, has some information, uh, please share it. You can put it in the chat. Um, the other thing is that I, I just found that there was such a similarity um, not only between how the schools were built, but the whole intent for the schools being built. Remember that both of these uh, men were, uh, uh, they were successful businessmen. And they were really uh, considering what they needed as far as a um, educated labor force. So they weren't going to get that if you had the majority of the people they had to hire not being educated. So th this was a... Um, a very uh, genius stroke for these men to to build these schools and to make it possible for so many of a uh, you know uh, overlooked population to not have the uh, opportunity of a quality education. Well, was a a substantial amount of money on the white schools as well? Is that correct? Yeah, but not as much on the, um, the uh, black schools. That seems to be all the questions we have. Is there any other uh, comments or? Uh... Well, I, I, I would like to really jump in here and um, uh, tag on to what you were talking about regarding the um, uh, pandemic, uh, Dan, because um, this was a very trying project to uh, complete during a pandemic. Um, not only it was going to be challenging enough dealing with that age group. We're, we're talking where the average age of the people we talked to was 82. So we, we're not talking about this uh, population that was uh, really uh, 
finesseful with the internet or just dealing with anything dealing with the internet. But luckily, because so many other organizations and companies and individuals had to go to a virtual um, a form of communication and meeting, uh, this actually helped us a great deal. But I, I need everyone to remember that we completed this entire project during the pandemic. We started it at the height of the pandemic. And then when we really got into the interviews, this was at the second wave of the pandemic. So we, we had some very challenging uh, things to go through, but thankful to uh, UPS and the uh, internet, and of course, the email on the internet. We were able to stay in touch with these individuals, be able to send them the information that uh, we needed to send them, and they were able to send information to us that we needed. And I, you know, I'm just very thankful, number one, to Dan, who uh, did a yeoman's job doing this project. I mean, I, I don't think we would have had anywhere near the success if Dan Parsons had not been a part of this, if Mike McGrath had not given his leadership and uh, 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 our own um, executive uh, director, uh, Jay McCutcheon, hadn't been there to uh, give us the type of uh, uh, internet and um, support as far as the different uh, websites and other um, formats that we needed to use as a uh, the undergird and to uh, support this particular project. So there are a number of people, but you know, I also have to give a, a, a huge shout out to uh, Dr. Skelcher, who just provided just a wealth of information and talent um, just throughout this entire project. I mean, he, he really gave a focus and, and kept us really, um, uh, other than just focus, he just kept us uh, on track and, and understanding what were the things we needed to talk about, what are the things that we uh, did not need to talk about. But most of all, I have to talk all, uh, thank all of the group of individuals that work with us with, on the African American Task Force, uh, because uh, without them, this this whole project probably couldn't have gotten off the ground to begin with. Mike, did you yeah. want to say anything on that? Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's been a great team effort. I think Abdullah has uh, characterized it very well. I think I think it's been so rewarding, I think, to participate in this. And for me to listen to all these voices, I, I got to uh, actually do the work sometimes of cutting out some of these snippets. So I got to hear even bigger parts of this. Uh, I'm just impressed with, uh, first of all, <laughs> being myself uh, getting older, I'm, I'm impressed with these people's memory, yeah. you know, particularly those that are like 90 something and 100 and something. I mean, it was just incredible. So all those people are, you know, just special people and provide this, uh, you know, look back into our history that, you know, actually is not available anywhere else. And that's why uh, one of the things I want to leave everyone with today is that my hope is that in the future, uh, we can expand this. There's more people out there who have recollection of these schools. Uh, there's more schools, too, uh, than those we looked at this go round, where there's people still out there that have not only the memories, but the memorabilia. I think mm. that's another important and absolutely essential part of this. Um, and then finally, what I would say as far as preservation Delaware's interest in the future is not only in expanding this in a, a couple of different dimensions, but making it available to the public and to our schools. Um, the public, you know, the real underpinning that I tried to get across in some of my remarks for this whole project is to illuminate a part of our history in Delaware that often goes overlooked underrepresented and and frankly just not included in our history and so you know what i envision for preservation delaware is to create uh probably an online uh presence for this information where people can explore both at a uh, sort of an educational level but then an in-depth level if they have an interest or perhaps some kind of relationship to some of these schools and then also to make it available in a usable way in the curriculum of Delaware school system and even to our secondary education levels. So that this history, um, these voices from the past 
uh, the memorabilia and all that we learn from these things uh, can actually become incorporated into our educational system. I think this is the step that we have to look forward to if, um, you know, this is really going to make a difference in expanding our shared stories. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I think uh, that's all the questions. Um, again, it was a wonderful opportunity to participate. I thank you for that. And uh, we gathered a lot of great information. I do plan on getting together with the people at Richard Allen and Rabbit's Ferry. I can tell you a lot of a lot of those sites received money in the bond bill for restoration. So I'm also helping with a couple of restoration projects at those sites. Terrific. Uh, I do want to point out one last thing there, because I was looking through some of the questions and I noticed that um, when we were talking about when the question was asked about where were some of these teachers, I, I had to point out that all of them that went to the state college for college students high school actually transitioned and became students at the Delaware State College. Um, and they all became teachers. So I thought that was very interesting that those who went to uh, <coughs> Delaware State College High School actually went to Delaware State College and became teachers. Well, um, very much. Uh, do we turn it back over to Alex now? Or? Sure, yeah, I just wanna say thanks so much for that um, presentation. I think it's really, really interesting. I actually had a quick question myself. So I, I, cause I know, and Mike, you sort of covered this a little bit with sort of what, what we hope the future is for this project. But um, I know when Mike Emmons mentioned, so around 47 of the 90 or so survived, but then less than 20 survived in a condition where they're recognizable. So I just want to commend you all on this work because, you know, it's, I guess, as somebody who studies buildings, when those are lost from the landscape, you sort of lose that physical reminder. But of course, we study these buildings to learn more about the people who, who use them and who lived in them or who went to school in them. So I think this work is just so important to sort of collect, collect this information that, you know, Mike and Dr. Mohammed, as you said, doesn't exist really anywhere else. So, um, so Mike, you mentioned it'll be hopefully available online in some way, but yeah, I guess how accessible will this, will this be? Like how can, how will people, or how do we hope people will be able to um, view it and use it and learn more about it? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, I don't necessarily have the answer right today. I mean, as we mentioned earlier, this, this presentation will be available on the uh, online presence of Preservation Delaware YouTube channel, uh, you know, links through our Facebook page and website and so on. Um, in, a, in addition, I think we're gonna have to discuss, and this will be a future discussion for Preservation Delaware in 2022, is how we might go about finding the funding to create an online website um, that will have different layers. I, I, vision, I, I envision something that has different layers depending on, you know, if you're a citizen that just wants to know more about the, the voices from the past, uh, that's interactive, that is uh, geographically based. So I'm hoping to tie it in with the CHAD work so that people can actually click on actual locations or see where all these schools were located, um, you know, and then produce what I've called a traveling show for schools and libraries where we can actually have some of these uh, reproductions maybe of the physical materials that actually can go on tour, can be used by social studies teachers, uh, actual curriculums uh, that can be meeting state standards for social studies that incorporate some of this work. Uh, it's, it's a big job, but I think one that over the next year or two, we can undertake. And the, and the last thing I failed to mention part of this educational process that I see, and having been involved in the state government, it's one that occurred to me early on. I would like to see Preservation Delaware push the legislature to place a uh, historic marker at every one of these locations. Even if that building does not exist today, I think this whole history is worthy of noting where these schools were located, having a brief story on that 
uh, historic marker about that particular school to the extent that we can do that. And not only to include the P.S. DuPont colored schools, but to also include what we know about the history and location of other schools that were built for African Americans, some that obviously predate uh, the DuPont schools. Uh, I believe probably most of those are gone, of course. But uh, again, I think the historic marker program is another way we have a permanent educational opportunity, if you will, uh, you know, in the state of Delaware to recognize the actual location and short story of these schools. I, I just want to say, uh, I noticed in the Q&A that there was a question that was asked about the T.D. Clayton School. Um, I believe it was Lynn who had asked whether or not it was still standing. And so in 2007, the, the school was actually uh, rededicated um, uh, pretty much in its original uh, building form and is now used as the administrative building for the Smyrna School District. So uh, yes, the school is still there. It's still in its uh, uh, original um, footprint of, uh, uh, of the school and uh, most of the classrooms have been converted to offices and you know subdivided to make uh, uh, office smaller offices inside those classrooms. So thanks for that question. Uh, um, there, if you go online and you just uh, pull up uh, the uh, TD Clayton School uh, transition, um, I forget right offhand what's the new name that they're calling it, but um, I know it's an administrative building down in uh, Myrna at this time. Well, thank you. Sorry, dog is <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you again. It looks like we are at our time, but thanks so much to Mike McGrath and Dr. Abdul Muhammad for presenting and, and to Dan, to you for moderating this. We really appreciate your time and, and facilitating this discussion. So I guess our sort of last part of the conference is, is coming up today at 11. It's the it's the board meeting, or well, I guess it's the, the annual meeting for this year. So um, I think you should be able to use the same link to join us at 11 for that. Um, and with that, I just wanna thank everybody again for, for attending and, and for taking the time to be here today. So thank you. Thank you for all your hard work too, Alex. Yes. Yeah, thanks You've Alex. You've done a, a tremendous job, Alex, putting all this together. Thank you all, I appreciate it. All right.